Hi, and welcome to Hims TV. I am here today with Dr. Aaron Jospi, Chief Medical Officer of Kairos, and Sonia Singh, who is Vice President of the Center of Consumerism for Avia. Welcome and thanks for joining us today. We're talking today about the digital front door and how to unlock that. So first I want to ask, what is the digital front door? Erin, would you like to start on that? When we think about what the digital front door is for a health system, I think most people land on that core component of the, um, the health system's website. But really, it extends beyond the health system's own digital properties, and it starts with how they are going to appear in a search engine, uh, such as Google. And so doing whatever they can to optimize that broader digital presence, um, by using things like Google My Business to their advantage so that consumers can find them easily. All of those things are aspects of what the digital front door is. Um, thinking about how their data gets syndicated out to uh, other uh, areas like Google, um, how they're going to leverage things like virtual engagement and triage solutions with things like virtual assistants, um, and certainly dynamic uh, find a doctor, or find a provider uh, search experiences and solutions that would allow their consumers to easily um, be able to view and then schedule appointments. I think all of those things get wrapped into how we like to think about the digital front door. Sonia, anything you'd like to add on that? Yeah, I agree with a lot of what Erin is saying. We've been doing this digital front door work at Avia with over 35 health systems, really helping them think about how do you put a digital front door together? So here's what I say. Digital front door is a lot more than a website, like Erin just said. Uh, it's a place where you as a health system, you can connect, transact, and interact with your consumers. So this is where consumers today find you, they learn about you. Here's where first impressions are made. Here's where you can start to create those moments of satisfaction and loyalty uh, by addressing those biggest and most common needs a consumer may have when they interact with you. Uh, so we call it getting transaction ready at your digital front door. So we've seen this for a while where people start with Google when they're searching for a symptom, a doctor, a location, and there's the opportunity for health systems to really capture that demand. Um, so how do you serve up simple but powerful tools at that point where there is that demand allowing consumers to complete a transaction like searching for a physician, scheduling an appointment, ratings and reviews, triaging a symptom, and getting on demand virtual care. So those are the transactional elements. And then what we recommend is to layer onto that and round out what we believe is the digital front door is additional interaction capabilities. So things like your mobile app, um, things like your website, and then the emergence of guided interactions like text, chat, and voice that can surface up those transactional capabilities in a new and personalized way. Well, I imagine with the COVID pandemic, digital is more important than ever. So what does this mean for COVID-19 patients unlocking the door for them? How, does, how is it working as far as during the pandemic? Uh, is it, it must be different now than, and more important, I imagine, than, than uh, pre-pandemic. Erin, do you want to talk about that? I love the way that you put that, Sonia, um, that it does inherently need to be transactional. And I think particularly when patients are vulnerable with symptoms that they fear could be COVID or needing to learn more about COVID, really leveraging your digital presence to educate and to guide them is such a tremendous opportunity. And we're really seeing health systems um, rise to the occasions and an avid hunger on the part of consumers to receive their education this way. So using tools like um, symptom checkers and um, chatbots to help guide patients, to allow them to um, really identify and not need to conclude for themselves that they have COVID, but do I have something that warrants additional investigation or how can I best take care of myself or my loved one that I'm concerned about? Um, so I think you're, you're absolutely right, Susan. People need this kind of information and to be able to access it in a way that is 
at the appropriate literacy level, that's mm. at the um, appropriate degree of vetted information level is really important. And I think that um, when it comes to health systems, as their brand is about being a reliable source of trusted information, of trusted guidance, where um, people really are, are in need of it, for them to deliver in that way and to use these tools is really kind of a shining and transitional moment, I think, in healthcare. Sonia? Yeah, I completely agree. I think the digital front door concept uh, just became so incredibly important. I think what we saw during the surge and early March is um, if people thought the call center was at front door, that was closed. Right, so people are waiting for 16, 20 hours. Uh, we have heard of some instances um, to get a call back or on hold. Um, so how do you start to use your digital front door uh, to really manage that demand and that shrinking capacity? So we see, saw a lot of people um, in their IVR direct to the website where there was a chat bot to help them to navigate through the different um, sources, whether that's educational, telling them about what clinics are open, what's not open, where you need to schedule or reschedule your appointments, uh, even those triage and symptom checker solutions on your website to be able to direct people based on COVID symptoms or not, being able to offer synchronous and not, um, asynchronous virtual visits as well uh, at that digital front door, just being such a big help to manage both the demand that was happening during the surge, but also the shrinking capacity of providers to be able to manage that demand. I think there's also a huge safety element too, if I can, if I can add um, to what you're saying, where um, the, there's an opportunity to really um, leverage that dwindling supply that you have and to ensure that it's being leveraged um, in, in the safest and best way possible. So to be able to use your digital properties um, to educate and guide patients so that they can keep themselves safe and unexposed if, if what they have is not actually mm -hmm. COVID, um, as right. well as to keep those that front line um, to be able to use their resources in as purposeful a manner as possible. Um, so you really have the opportunity to keep the maximum number of people safe um, and to create these remote clinical settings that are not brick and mortar, but are still incredibly satisfying and, and accurate. Such a great point, yes. Technology is needed for all of this, the technology on the part of the provider, and also different consumers have different levels of technology and knowledge. Um, are there any recommendations you have uh, for hospital systems about what technology they should be looking for and what they should be uh, recommending to their, to their patients? The digital divide, as we're you know, starting to call it, is real in addition to the socioeconomic disparities across patient populations that exist. So that one size fits all approach doesn't always work that well. So you have to consider things like context, languages, health literacy, mobile phone penetration within various communities, age in elderly populations and how they consume technology. A um, Couple of examples over here is um, a health navigation service, for example, is really important to reach various populations that can be digitally offered. It can be supplemented by humans, but it really should incorporate multiple languages and sh should understand the context that various communities consume healthcare services differently and how do you reach them with that context. So things like texting, particularly in communities where you know mobile penetration is high, is really effective. But you have to also make it context sensitive in the appropriate languages. You provide education that's appropriate. Um, we've also seen uh, health systems use a uh, pandemic worker program in some states where um, instead of just assuming that a, a patient is able to set up technology on their own, actually having somebody go to their homes uh, for things like remote monitoring with the tablet, with education, even with a data package in certain instances, knowing that broadband and Wi-Fi is not available all the time and set it up for them um, to be able to educate them at that point of care has been really effective as well. So those are some of the examples we're seeing of how do you start to really understand that context um, and the difference in different communities to be able to reach them with technology. I so agree with what you're saying, Sonia. Um, and I think it's so important to acknowledge um, just cultural acceptability of certain of these technologies to be the delivery mechanism. So there is an opportunity for technology 
Um, I can't emphasize enough the importance of language and really um, making sure that people have the cultural sensitivity uh, as the providers of care to make sure that they're doing so in a way that will resonate and, and forge bonds rather than break them. Um, mm -hmm. I think that's particularly true as we think about the needs from a public health standpoint with contact tracing, um, the additional support that's necessary for access centers where you may be the first um, to really be engaging patients uh, in a very human to human way um, and that sometimes that can't be replaced with a technology. So making sure that you're leveraging the people behind the technology where it's appropriate and using those other um, tools in a way um, to really leverage them to their greatest potential. So absolutely where we can talk about home monitoring and where we can get, um, you know, still leverage the good old fashioned telephone. Um, we just need people to pick them up sometimes, uh, <laughs> but not everyone wants to turn on a Zoom meeting, and so video might not be the best way to reach people. Um, and so to recognize that we all have our own cultural biases and we need to be sensitive and aware that certain technical tools will be um, more or less resonant in different communities. You talked about um, Zoom not being for everybody. I think most people know now about telehealth who've had to have a doctor's visit over the last three or four months. What about other ways to communicate, like chat box, or, or what, what uh, things are you finding are popular with patients to use? Yeah, we're seeing uh, text and chat really rise in popularity um, and use and adoption on both sides, both the consumer, the patient, as well as the health system. Um, I think, you know, we talked earlier about how the call centers are continue to be overwhelmed. Uh, so you need to find um, technology-based ways to reach out and communicate with communities. Uh, so chat, it, we, you know, you, you can use it in different ways. Chatbots in particular, we've seen for triage, um, or symptom checking. Uh, we've seen it for navigation to educational resources. And then text, um, such an interesting rise in text that I am watching and uh, you know, being able to personalize messages to consumers and patients mm -hmm. um, with the text message. And I think we all know, like, text messages are read much more often than an uh, email or even um, voicemail, right? Mm -hmm. So you have a much higher rate of response for text messages. So actually, it's much more effective as well, particularly when text messages can be bi-directional and you can start to surface up transactions in those text messages, things like, hey, your appointment needs to be rescheduled or it's time for you to come in again and like click on the text message itself to do the schedule um, or click on the text message to be directed to the right resource or the right um, education. I think that there's just so many use cases that's possible through those what we call guided interactions, things like text and chat where you can use automation to really create intelligent conversations that doesn't always have to be manned by a human. So again, from an operational standpoint, it's very effective as well. Of course, a lot of this depends for providers on what will be reimbursed in the future for these digital uh, communications. Um, and I think um, everybody's waiting to see what CMS will do as far as making some of these waivers permanent, especially because we're looking at a resurgence everybody is saying perhaps in the fall of COVID-19. And I'm wondering, given the parameters of what we know about the waivers, what may or may not continue as far as reimbursement, what can uh, organizations do now to prepare for that second wave uh, should it come as projected? I have to um, confess that my, my desperate hope is that now that, um, now that both consumers and patients and providers have had a taste of what telemedicine has to offer, um, that virtual care is here to stay as a reimbursable um, transaction. And I think it would be so short-sighted to erode that, that progress that we've made by, by reverting back to earlier um, yeah. payment scales. Um, I do think that there will be incredible demand. It is so much more convenient 
when it's clinically appropriate to get your care through a, a virtual encounter, um, to not have to pay for parking, to not have to find childcare, to be able to do it from the comfort of your own home. Um, you know, when you're not feeling well, it's really hard to get in a car and go someplace else and, and be checked out. Mm -hmm. um, as well as the lingering anxiety of just being in public spaces like waiting rooms. And so the idea that we could actually be both more safe as well as more cost effective, I think, is really appealing. And I do think that there are specialties that are uh, particularly suited to telemedicine and virtual care encounters. Uh, and it's, it's taken this watershed moment, I think, to get that kind of buy-in. There's been so much trepidation. Um, yes. as, as a physician, I can say that you know, we're not at the, at the forefront of pioneering <laughs> you know, great new <laughs> cost models and delivery <laughs> mechanisms, but, but this is working. Um, and I think that there is satisfaction. Um, I'm hoping that health systems will look at the satisfaction on both sides to be able to have data to anecdotally support these stories of success with virtual care as well. Um, to be able to say, yes, we, we can concretely say that our providers are embracing this and would prefer to do so. That we have been able to see cost savings by moving our access center remote. Uh, and so why not continue to leverage that as a benefit to the health system as well as an advantage to those access center agents themselves. Uh, and to create a, uh, to maybe leverage some of those cost savings into even more robust digital experiences uh, to the benefit of both the patient community and the provider community as well.